Good morning, everyone. This is uh, Mark Erkin, and um, I want to welcome you to our Friday morning program. Um, I have put up a slide for the World Congress on Thyroid Cancer. Um, I suspect there still is some time to register for the program that will take place uh, tomorrow. That's the second of three scheduled installments. Um, we anticipate that there will be a fourth installment coming up in December. So if any of you want to be a, um, a last minute registry for, register for that, um, feel free to uh, log on to their website. So as we've mentioned uh, along the way here, we are varying um, our Friday morning program and including a number of different types of formats of which um, this morning is one and some of, and what we're trying to do is to respond to your requests. Um, and so this is indeed a basic lecture um, to provide a framework for many of the exciting new developments that are taking place in thyroid cancer management. And it's a great pleasure for me to introduce our two speakers for this morning's lecture. Dr. Jane Heldsworth um, is the Director of Molecular Clinical Laboratory at Mount Sinai. Her role is to integrate testing across clinical laboratory disciplines within the Molecular Pathology Division where she serves as the vice chair. She played a very critical role in bringing rapid BRF testing to Mount Sinai in order to answer the call from clinicians um, who are faced with the management of anaplastic thyroid cancer patients. Um, she is the director of Molecular Genetics Pathology Fellowship Program, and she has served as reviewer and chairman on NIH study sections. Um, in addition, this morning, um, she is joined by Dr. Um, Minakshi uh, Maroda, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Pathology, Molecular, and Cell-Based Medicine. She also serves as the assistant director of the Clinical Molecular Pathology Lab of the Mount Sinai Health System. Dr. Maroda is involved um, in the development of new assays and technology, uh, which involves somatic mutation detection, identification of translocations, and the detection of copy num number alterations. She has been significantly involved in the validation and the utilization of a next-gen sequencing assay for the detection of somatic mutations in solid tumors um, and liquid biopsies, all of which we will be covering this morning. And so her involvement in translational research at Mount Sinai um, uh, has been uh, significant um, in an effort to apply new diagnostic platforms to clinical oncology. And so with that, I want to welcome um, our two speakers and um, encourage all of you, as we do every week, to send in your questions. I just want to say there is no question um, today that is too basic um, for our panelists uh, to answer. So this is your opportunity to get those, lang those lingering questions out, um, and we'll try to get you answers. So with that, I'm going to turn over the program and, um, uh, and feel free to uh, just click on the question tab and send those in. Uh, thank you, Mark, for that kind introduction. And thank you also to Margie and Mark for the invitation to present. Uh, you should be able to clearly see now my next slide, which is much the same. And now we have neither of us have conflicts of interest to disclose. So I'd like to start with this first presentation of the and describe the ohms of biology. It is alterations in these various ohms here as listed that actually ultimately end up in the phenotype of the, of the ohm that we wish to study here and talk about today, which is cancer. Overlaid in that, and of course, is we have to be able to also study alterations in microbiome and the virome, in particular for head and neck cancers for high-risk HPV. You may be very familiar with the study of metabolites by uh, mass spec or in regular routine clinical laboratories, chemistry laboratories. You're familiar with the study of proteins by such as immunohistochemistry in pathology departments. What we focus on in our analyses in our clinical laboratories is the study of alterations in the genome, in the transcriptome, 
to a lesser extent in the epigenome where we're looking for changes in methylation or acetylation and also on the virome in particular in the context of head and neck and thyroid cancers. When we are selecting an assay to, to a methodology in order to be able to analyze these specimens and neoplasms, of course our choice of methodology is highly dependent on what ohm we are actually going to be analyzing. But it's also guided by a number of other considerations. In particular, how much material do we actually have to study? What is the contamination of the material that we have to study? Is there adequate tumor burden in that specimen? Does the tumor change depending on where you are sampling it? What is the type of alteration in the ohm that we are looking for? Do we want to be extremely comprehensive or look simply at a single gene? And of course, what is the turnaround time that Mark was alluding to already with respect to the rapid BRAF testing? Other considerations that I'm not going to talk about today are available technology and also of cost in, and reimbursement in the clinical setting. So I'm going to go through some of these first with explanations as to why those are important in selecting the methodology. The first one is specimen types. These are the types of specimens that we may receive in a molecular laboratory in which to perform analyses. And for, for the discussion today, these are the most common that we may receive. And while we may not have an issue with abundancy in these types of specimens that we receive, it's especially important in FNAs that we are given in order to be able to get abundant material for, we, for us to study. So if you go through the process of FNA processing, the different stages from collection to processing to develop the, the materials that are being studied and reviewed, we tend to find ourselves becoming in the molecular lab scavengers. And what we found over the years is that we can use different phases of this procedure and processing to in order to be able to perform the molecular analyses of the DNA and RNA. For example, the DIFQUIC smear is a very good source of DNA for us to analyze, not so much RNA. The cell block, while there are fewer cells, it actually has and is used routinely for DNA and RNA extraction for sequencing for tumor profiling. However, we tend to be at the bottom of the selection in terms of after, after a number of cuts have been made, we, for immunohistochemistry or diagnostic purposes, then we get our specimen for molecular and sometimes these small blocks can be depleted. We can also use the thin prep, but importantly, what's been found in the last number of years, it's this discard FNA washes and supernatant that are a rich source for DNA and RNA that we can actually use. Now, these specimens, specimens here, we can actually examine morphologically to, turn, to tell us what in my next consideration is what proportion of the sample is tumor versus benign material and hence contaminating for us. But in these, we cannot. So why is that an important consideration? And on the next slide, I'm showing you what you may find, and I've tried to do this throughout the presentation, the terms that you may find on some molecular diagnostic reports for specimens that you've been testing. For example, tumor burden of cellularity is the proportion of tumor nuclei over nuclei that are tumor plus benign. So in a case like this, there's a very large proportion of the matter that we're going to be extracting DNA and RNA from, from the tumor. So we have a very high chance of picking up the alterations that are in this specimen. In this core biopsy, we don't have as great a chance because the estimation of the tumor burden is only about 10%. That being said though, we can actually macro dissect this tumor, cut off this end here, so that we can essentially enrich for the tumor cells. And in that circumstance, we can actually get about 60% of tumor burden. 
This specimen, on the other hand, upon review, is showing, in fact, that while there may be abundant tissue itself, that the actual tumor cells and their proportion is very small, estimated to be about 5%. We can't enrich with macro dissection, and there is a very high possibility of a potential for false negatives in the methodology that we use. Either we choose a more sensitive method or we may want to look at how we can laser dissect such cases. Why is this limit of detection and the methodology and the sensitivity important? It's because in a large number of these molecular analyses and alteration studies that we're trying to detect is that we are either doing it for therapeutic purpose, prognostic purpose, or diagnostic purpose. In the case of therapeutic purpose, we are often trying to identify the driver mutation. This driver mutation is often in the heterozygous state. It's not, it should, a lot of cases, it's present in every single tumor cell. It may not be in others. We also find that these essential passenger mutations, they differ, they may also be present in every cell, but they differ from the driver in that this driver was important for the transformation process, whereas these tend to be more important for the survival of the tumor. Then you will have other mutations that we call passenger mutations, that they're essentially non-essential in the initial setting. It is these mutations that we are trying to identify that become the Achilles heels of that tumor that we try to I identify and then in, uh, impact with respect to a therapeutic agent. So if we go back to the analytical setting then, if we have a tumor burden of 10%, then this driver mutation will only be present in about 5% of the cells. Obviously, better tumor burden, we have a better chance of picking it up. So reverse engineering that, if my limit of detection is only 5%, then I need at least 10% tumor burden. This becomes important when we examine some of the technologies that we have available to us. This limit of detection could be as high as 20%. It could be as low as 0.01%. 0 .01%. That's an important point to, to make. Now, I said one of the considerations is the type of genomic alterations that we may be looking for. In this case, it's important to note that the human genome has alterations in it relative to the respected reference sequence that we use. These happen both in the normal as well as in the disease state. And if they are differences, we generally give them the name of a variant. And you will hear this word used a lot. These variants can be at the single nucleotide level, at which we call them single nucleotide variants. They can be small insertions or indels. If they are small, we call them indels. When they are this small, we generally tend to sequence and look at interrogate the genome and we usually then infer the change that will result from these alterations in the genome, what is happening in the RNA, cDNA and also what impact that will have on the protein. As the alterations start to get larger in size, for example a larger deletion or a larger du du duplication or gain, we give them a different name. Now they are called copy number alterations, but they're essentially larger gains or deletions. We also have, we also have other types of, of alterations in the genome that we need to search for, and these are translocations or rearrangements. It is these alterations now that we may choose a slightly different method to use. Rather than interrogating the genome, we may now interrogate the RNA. And we will still use sequencing, but in this time now, we are looking for the products of these alterations, such as a change in level of expression of a, of a, of a gene or a fusion, which you have heard of that we often detect by sequencing the RNA, not the DNA. 
Beware though, when you are sequencing the RNA, that there are multiple other alterations that are occurring not in the genome that can also cause changes in these RNAs, such as alternative splicing or epigenomic impact and alterations. So the next consideration is, are we going to be, do we want to be very broad and comprehensive in analysis or hone down and look at single genes? And as you are aware, as we look at the entire comprehensive genome all the way through to chromosomes, we start honing down now to genes themselves, which are mostly organized in some exons, non-coding material or introns, and exons that are eventually used to transcribe into a precursor messenger RNA, which with splicing gives down to the messenger RNA, finally undergoing translation into the protein. So there are technologies out there where you can actually sequence the entire genome in the, in the, ge in the actual nucleus in these cells. Those are commonly called WGS. So they are actually sequencing across all the DNA, which includes all the 21,000 protein coding genes, the non-coding genes as well, as well as the rest of the intervening DNA sequences, which we don't always know how to interpret as yet. Other technologies have been developed and are in clinical practice in some places now, where they sequence the whole exome. And that mostly means that they're actually targeting these areas of the exons, only mostly of the protein coding genes. So when you see WES, whole exome sequencing, that is what is being targeted and sequenced only. We also have, if we were thinking about RNA whole transcriptome sequencing, and there we're sequencing the, all the RNA that is, and usually it's only the messenger RNA that we are examining. However, what's more frequent in, in clinical use for analysis of, of tumors in the, for therapeutic selection is we do honing it down even further where we may select the genes that we want to sequence. So we have more targeted sequencing. And in fact, for some, we may only look at certain hotspot regions where mutations have been found to occur very frequently and have clinical impact. We may also choose to go down to a single gene level or even a single variant. The further we go down in what we are actually analyzing and looking for, it becomes less comprehensive, but much more, we have a much better limit of detection so we can actually use these for tracking the course of the disease then. It's not a, we do actually have a nomenclature set up according to the HGVS. It's an international standard. And I would urge you, please, uh, if you are writing in clinical notes, some of the alterations that have been found for some of your tumors, that you not necessarily give the genomic alteration because you may not have those on every report. You may not also show the cDNA alterations that, you, that were reported, but I would urge at the very least that we, that we list what is the actual protein nomenclature? And there's a reason for that. So if I go back to these, you'll see the genomic tells you where it occurs and what nucleotides have changed. In the cDNA, we do the same thing. And it could be single, it could be double, it could be between these two nucleotides, we've inserted another, this results in a frame shift. If you see something that says C.1 with a minus, it means it's a number of nucleotides upstream of the fir first. This you may have recognized in the TERT gene, that would be occurring in the promoter then. These then are actually occurring in splice sites of genes adjacent to the exons where we presume that they have an impact on the splicing. It is these protein changes, which are which we have the prefix of P dot, slightly different way of writing it. We write the codon, we write the number of the codon and what it becomes. And of course, this is an important one in your area. 
And I wanted to make one point out is that while you may have the same change in the protein, actually it is this particular change can occur from two different alterations in the DNA. So that's an important consideration for us when we are analyzing these and giving offering methodologies. You will find others where you will see this asterisk at the end. It means that the alteration caused a stop codon or a truncation. You will also see these others which have caused a frame shift and we will tell you it's originally an alanine. Now we have a frame shift and there's a stop codon, nine codons later on. So when you view your reports, you should see these alterations. And again, I would urge you in your notes, if you're going to write them down, you actually write this complete thing here. That's very useful. Now, when we analyze these, I, I, we also have to use and we uh, uh, different databases in order to be able to determine whether the variants that we are picking up are actually arising in the tumor somatic or they're in the germline of the patient. This becomes important because most laboratories like us really only analyze the tumor itself. We have databases and I've given you a couple here that we use routinely. I apologize to our international contingent who may be on the phone. Uh, there are others available um, and I'm sure that uh, everybody has their some of the databases that they use, but these are the ones that we commonly use here. Some of them even give you, in this particular case, they've sequenced over 100,000 alleles of a potentially normal population, and we even get insight into these variants, whether they're unique to individuals or they are associated with populations, which more than likely indicates that these are germline we look at other databases. Once we've made, tried to make a decision if the alterations that we see are somatic or germline, we then go down and try to infer what is the impact of this alteration on the gene itself. And now we use slightly different databases, some coming out of the US, one out of the UK, and it is this one that I'd actually like to spend a little bit of time in showing you how we could use it. So if you have access and your phone or whatever and you'd like to log on, I would urge you just while for the next few slides to go on and, and show how to do the search yourself. This is a curated database by Memorial Sloan Kettering and it's important to notice that they actually sequence tumor to normal matched, others do not. So in this case, you go into OncoKB, you can search BRAF, this is the page that shows up. It gives you in their data set a percentage alteration that's been found in different tumor types. It also gives you a little background information here. You can click on this and you can read a little bit about it. That's very helpful when it's a gene you've never heard of before. It also gives you a lolly plot where you can see where the hotspots are and where they have actually reported variants themselves in the gene. The color makes a difference as to what type of alteration it is. What is important though are these three tabs or four tabs down here. And the one that usually opens up on is this therapeutic tab. And you can see here that this therapeutic tab is listing, for example, anaplastic thyroid cancer, V600E, here are potential therapeutic options. And in this particular case, they also give a level which is related to whether it's an FDA biomarker approved therapeutic indicator in this, in this, in this disease type. If you scroll down further using this scroll tab here, you will see then that they list others. For example, this is a very deliberate V600. That means it could be E, K, whatever the final alteration is. It's now in this particular level associate, it has been reported as a biomarker NCCN, but not necessarily FDA biomarker. And you'll see that there are various alterations in BRAF where there have been therapeutic uh, indications with different drugs in different diseases at different levels. I'd urge you then to click on annotated alterations. If you click on here now, 
you'll see lists of the alterations that are picked up in the gene and then their interpretation, and most of us concur, as to whether or not this alteration is oncogenic and also whether or not what is the impact. Is it going to give a gain of function to the protein or a loss of function? Or in fact, you can also find change of function. It is these ones that say gain of function that are going to be easier targets in order to develop a therapeutic agent or you may want to select. Also listed in this annotated alterations are the fusions, the amplifications, and you can see they also have an oncogenicity call and they have a mutation effect. And over here on the right, you can see the citations where which would give evidence to support. You also see here one that's diagnostic. And in these diseases, the presence of these alterations may be diagnostic. So while we have actually identified in many diseases activating oncogenic gain of function alterations, it's also been dependent on the development of these therapeutic agents themselves. And I wanted to give you an example down here of KRAS. One of the most common alterations in KRAS is G12C. This G12C is seen very commonly in many cancer types, but in non-small cell cancer, it is a driver gene. There's no potential therapeutic target to other than just now, recently, these have been approved in, in these diseases by the FDA, two different companies. So this has taken a long time from our first initial knowledge that this was an activating mutation to getting a therapeutic agent. I wanted to also bring up, if you go and type in TP53, you get the same information, but what's important for this gene, which is essential for the survival, is that you will see that there is no therapeutic tab here. And that's why often the genes that may, while they may be oncogenic, they can lead to loss of function. So it's much more difficult to target and reactivate a gene that it, and its function, functional impact in the tumor versus targeting an activating alteration. So if we go then and make decisions about, do we want to uh, evaluate a comprehensive panel or hone down, some of the data sets that are available to you now that you can explore this for your own interests as well as is the panel that I'm using or testing uh, comprehensive enough. Many of the studies in the beginning were done by the Cancer Genome Atlas. Um, those were whole exome, whole transcriptome often. Uh, they have been imported and their data have come into a couple of different sites that can be used. I'm going to highlight two of them. One is cbioportal uh, in org at MSKCC, where you can see that they list the disease type and you can see that they're representing and they've collated the data from a number of different studies coming, for example, Dana-Farber from their own MSK. You will see TCGA data sets and different, they talk about what the publications are that, that include the data sets. If you pick on thyroid, for example, and you progress through and pick on, and I chose poorly differentiated and anaplastic thyroid. You can see we've got 117 cases. And this page allows you to explore then not only the mutations in the genes that are found. If you click on each of these, you can look at the identity of them, what they are, the frequency in which it was found, what structural alterations, for example, fusions, for example, in RET they may have found, copy number alterations, gains and losses, and a variety of other features about the cohort. For example, what was the cytology result? So you can explore these, and this is one of the potential sites. Another site that you can explore and use is the Firehose Legacy. I bring these up because you may find them referenced on some of your reports in terms of indications of frequency. This is coming out of the Broad. Again, his thyroid, 
there that's all of them and you can see that you can now do a similar browse of 500 cases that are in there these are very useful for your for your reviewing both for clinical utility and all and associations as well as for research studies so keeping in the vein of thyroid we thought that we'd discuss our, our methodological advances and utilities in the context of ThyroSeq. Um, while it is comprehensive, it is targeted NGS. It can use, they extract DNA and RNA either from directly from the FNA or from the material. And this involves targeted 112 genes and even those are not entire. They've done a lot of hotspots. They evaluate a large number of SNVs and indels, those small changes. They look for copy number alterations of 10 genomic alterations in FNA samples, 27 in paraffin embedded material. They can look for many gene fusions and they look for aberrant expression of 19 genes. Now they've done a little bit of selection here based on examination of those large data sets and their own that I told you about. And they've done something unique to thyroid cancer to be able to give an estimation of the risk of, of probability of cancer. And Manakshi, my colleague, is now going to present from further on down and talk to you more now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, you can see my screen now. Um, thank you, Jane, and thank you, organizers, for giving me opportunity to present this. I'm going to talk about the technologies which we use for uh, comprehensive or single gene testing, such as next generation sequencing. So next generation sequencing utilizes two aspects. One is wet bench and the other is dry bench. So wet bench consists of three parts. One is extraction of nucleic acid. So once we receive the material, we extract nucleic acid quantify it, and then qualify it, whether it is suitable for sequencing or not. Then the second step is library prep. So library prep involves like once you qualify the material, you prepare your libraries basically, um, in that you can enrich your target sequence, which is need to be evaluated. If you want to sequence whole exome, you can sequence whole exome. If you want to sequence whole genome, then you target whole genome. After your libraries were prepared, um, and which can vary from method to method, um, then you have to sequence it. For sequencing, most of the clinical labs utilizes these two platforms. One is termed as INS 5XL, which is based on semiconductor sequencing. Um, and one is MySeq, which is, um, which is based on optical imaging technology. After the sequencing is done, you you take care of dry part. What is this dry part? It's basically all the data analysis which we go through, um, which includes alignment, variant calling, annotation, and clinical annotation, which we go over uh, later on. So, uh, then um, for the library prep, we have two uh, most common technologies which we utilize most of the time in clinical labs. One is amplicon-based technology and hybrid capture-based technology. Amplicon-based technology, you take your DNA template, um, like the material which you qualify, and then you have a primer pool, um, which includes like for covering the genes of your target region. Um, and then you amplify that, uh, barcode it, and then sequence it. For hybrid capture, in spite of amplifying, you will design the probes which will hybridize to your target regions. And then you uh, isolate those targeted regions and then amplify it and then sequence it. So these both the methods have their pros and cons in the, uh, and they are specific like uh, according to the need. So for example, um, for amplicon enrichment, the input DNA requirement is very low, like around 20 nanogram. So you can definitely use it very clearly for solid tumors. While in hybrid capture, since you are not amplifying it, you require a um, comparable large amount of material um, as compared to amplicon based assays. Um, the workflow is straightforward and shorter, uh, whereas in hybrid capture, it is longer because you are going to hybridize it for a longer time. The capture size, uh, since it's a um, primer-based and amplicon-based chemistry, you can do at 5 kb to 500 kb. 
where is in hybrid capture, you can cover whole exome or whole genome along with that. Um, so sensitivity of hybrid capture is higher as compared to amplicon based because um, you are enriching your targets basically. While ap application is limited because you require a huge amount of DNA. Uh, so the thyroseq assay is basically an NGS based targeted assay which is based on amplicon enrichment. Now let's cover the dry branch aspects of NGS. So after your sequencing is done and you qualify that your sequencing run looks good, you follow a, a multiple steps to get the data out of it. So first is like alignment. Once you receive the raw reads, you align it to the reference genome um, and then align it to your targeted regions if you are taking a targeted region. Uh, okay, and uh, targeted panels. Then after your alignment, you will be able to, um, you will do variant calling, which helps you to identify variants compared to the reference genome. What type of variants you identify or what type of changes you identify. Either they will be SNV, single nucleotide variants, they will be in this insertion or deletion. They can be copy number variations. Um, after you get that in the genome there is a change, you will filter that, uh, filter that on the basis of a certain matrix, such as read depth. What is read depth? So read depth basically we call it as coverage. So at a single point, like how many times a sequence of read, we termed it as read depth. Um, and see in the example in the right that you can see this is a reference sequence and this is the change sequence. So the number of reads in the gray is basically like how many times it read is termed as coverage. Now variant allelic frequency. So how many times in the read which you have read seeing the change is termed as variant allelic frequency of that. Um, another term is global allelic frequency, which is also known as population frequency. So for a mutation, what's the frequency of that change in a normal population? Homopolymer region. So homopolymer region is like in the genome, there are stretches of the nucleotides like A, G, or C. In those regions, basically ion torin chemistry or semiconductor technology is not great to call or pick up the deletions or indels. So that's a limitation of one of the limitation of ion torin sequencing. Um, followed by annotation. So once you filter the call on the basis of established criteria, you, you want to know or you want to annotate it to see what's the, whether the call is functionally relevant or not. So for that, you will go back and look into the databases which Dr. Hose was just talk about to differentiate whether it's a germline call, whether, whether it's a somatic call, it has functional impact, and what's the clinical interpretation of that. So, um, Limit of detection of NGS is highly dependent on read depth. So we talk about read depth. So you know in the genome, uh, all the regions are not very well uh, amplified or they are not covered well. So the regions where you have a very good depth of coverage, your sensitivity is very higher to pick even the smaller mutations. But the regions where your, your depth is poor, like here in the bottom, you can see the, the sensitivity is very Poor. It's not that great because, because also you will find a lot of artifacts in this region, which you can see in this purple tag. So for example, if you have a hundred X, lesser than 100X coverage, your sensitivity of assay will be 20%. If you have 100X to 500X coverage, then your sensitivity will be 5%. But if you have a 500X coverage, then your sensitivity will be greater than 500X, the sensitivity will be 2 to 5%. So for thyroseq and GS-based assay, they require a minimum coverage of 500x. If an amplicon or region does not meet that this, this criteria, they call that specific region to be faked. So after the data analysis, you will get this type of uh, table, or I should say you can get a list of variants, um, which, which you will find it out that you have a chromosome ID, you have a nucleotide position of that chain, what is the reference, and what is the change you are seeing, in which gene you are seeing, what's the total read or the coverage of those, um, those uh, alterations, um, and then how many reads of, of the alterations are there, um, then it's the VAF or variant allelic frequency of that change and the CDN and the protein change. So for um, thyrosy, the analytical sensitivity of the assay for SNV detection is, a, is high and it is around 3 to 5 percent VAF for the, for the samples which have 6 to 10 percent tumor cells. The most common gene or clinical gene, uh, relevant gene which they report is BRAF, RAS, TERT, um, TP53. 
So now let's uh, move to the uh, detection of copy number alterations, which are NGS based. So we know that for copy number alterations, we do most of the time array array based chemistries. Um, but here we are talking about copy number alteration detection by NGS. And with the help of NGS, you can target uh, like a targeted detection of copy number alteration, or you can determine a comprehensive chromosomal gain or losses. Um, so for the targeted focal gene or gain uh, losses, you can do the targeted sequencing. So here is a whole genome view of the targeted sequencing where you can see here in the example is a gain of EGFR, CCND1, and CDK4. So you can see that in the chromosome 7, you can see the gain. And in 11 here, you can see the gain. As compared to focal gene and gain and losses, you can do comprehensive uh, gain and losses through NGS also by using an ultra low pass NGS. What is ultra low pass NGS? Ultra low pass NGS is basically the whole genome sequencing done at very low coverage. This is um, very uh, inexpensive high throughput technology, which can be a substitute for the array based detection of copy number. For thyroseq assay, the sensitivity for detection of copy number assay is uh, 92% and with a limit of detection of 20 to 25% tumor cells in FNA and 40 to 70% tumor cells in FFP samples. So we talk about a comprehensive detection method. Now let's go and move to the single, single gene base. So not every time we require a comprehensive assessment of a sample. So if we require a single gene based assessment, what are the different technologies we can use for the detection? So one is Sanger, Sanger sequencing based technology. Uh, Sanger sequencing is a conventional uh, sequencing where you utilize a PCR and chain terminating dideoxy triphosphates. These are tagged with a special chlorophores which terminate the change amplifying nucleotide amplifying template uh, and generate a different size fragments which you can detect using capillary electrophoresis. Once you get the reading out of it, you align it to your reference to find that whether there is a change or not. Uh, it is still considered as a gold standard and is utilized for uh, confirmation of NGS calls sometimes, but its limit of detection is around 20%. Uh, another limitation is that you can do one sequence at a time and read 300 to 500 base pairs only. Now, uh, what is PCR? We talk about PCR, but what is basically PCR? For the PCR, you take a DNA template and you, which you want to amplify basically, and then you provide uh, some uh, material to amplify it basically like a primers, uh, DNTPs, uh, polymerase. How you are providing these primers, either they are tagged with chlorophore or they are plain, depending on that will decide the technology. So, so like for example, this is a tap template, we denature them and then we pr provide the primers and then these primers with the help of DNTPs and polymerase will generate the amplicon or the product. For the next cycle, this will serve as a template and then you will again get a doublet, doublet copy of that. So with each ongoing cycle, you are going to increase the copies. The end product which is formed, how are you going to quantify it or how are you going to check it? You will do a qualitative assessment of it by running a gel. Uh, so you can see this is a positive and then you compare it with the known size uh, markers. The another way is to quantitate it in real time. So this is a real time based PCR assessment where um, you, your, these primers are tagged with the fluorophore and the time at which you, you strike or you first see the fluorescence, um, that will determine like how much product. So as soon as you encounter this fluorescence, the higher the concentration. If you encounter this fluorescence later on during the run, that's the lower the concentration. Another method is also quantitative when you are detecting the size of the indels. So another requirement or need is the rapid turnaround time. So Idela system offers a rapid real-time based assay for detection of um, mutations, single gene mutations. So for that, you require a specimen requirement of one to five microns section, um, which has at least 10% tumor burden, or a genomic DNA extracted from FNA passes or FNA washes. You can see here the example of a material which we get from um, from the um, from our lab, and then you can see that here we the the day we receive a sample, we able to report the results within the same day by detecting this BRAF V600 alteration. 
Now there is another need, like if if you are looking what is increase is increased sensitivity. So uh, we talk about PCR, we talk about uh, qPCR. They are more common technologies utilized in the clinical labs. This, this is another technology called droplet digital PCR. It offers a sensitivity of 0.01 percent or even lower than that sometimes. What is this digital PCR? So digital PCR, you have a DNA fragments and PCR reagents which are dispersed in these droplets. Then you amplify these uh, targets in these droplets. And then you each droplet is counted for the presence of fluorescence. So here you can see that you read out these droplets, whether it is mutant or it is the droplets is having mutant or wild type or only wild type. This um, provided additional advantage as compared to PCR and qPCR in the term that um, this don't require any standard. Um, it's work with very low amount of material. It provide higher sensitivity. Um, and then there is a multiplexing capability also possible uh, by digital PCR. Another way to um, increase the sensitivity is incorporate unique molecular identifiers um, in the NGS. What is this unique molecular identifier? These are basically the barcodes or tags you tag it to individual DNA molecule during your NGS sequencing. Uh, and then later on during the analysis, these unique molecular identifiers will help you to remove the PCR duplicates um, and, and hence increasing the sensitivity of 0.1 to 0.2 percent. So with this, um, with this incorporation, you can utilize it for ctDNA assessment in plasma for liquid biopsy. So um, now we move on to the technologies which is RNA-based, um, such as fusion detection. So fusion detection can be of like a targeted fusion breakpoint assessment. So um, for the assays where you know what fusion it is or you have a targeted a fusion uh, assessment, you design the primers into um, a forward and reverse primer for two genes, and then you amplify it. Once you amplify it, then you align these reads to the reference sequence, and you're able to identify the fusions. So for example, here is EML4 ALK fusion of e EML4 6 exon and ALK 20 exon. This is sensitive and specific detection for fusion breakpoints. Um, you count the number of supporting reads of fusions. Um, that will give you a confidence whether it is true or not. Um, Tyroseq assay provide 99% uh, sensitivity for detection of fuse targeted fusions in 1% to 3% of tumor cells. Most common fusions they target is RET and PREC1 and PREC3 and BRAP. Now, you can, with this NGS-based RNA sequencing technology, you can also estimate the differential gene expression. What is this differential gene expression? So the, for, for, for estimating or determining this, it's the similar process um, as we go for a DNA library prep. It's just, it involves an additional step uh, where you have to convert RNA to uh, cDNA using a RT-PCR. Um, um, and then you, for the dry range also, it involves the similar steps, like you do quality control, pre-process pre the data, and then align it with the reference genome, and then do the transcript assembly. And then after the transcript or exon assembly, you quantify the expression of genes. The most common genes which they target for tyrosine is met, uh, calca and PTH genes. So what is unique to thyroid nodules that um, most of the time we perform NGS testing on malignant samples, but um, for what is unique to thyroid nodules that we do NGS testing to determine, to differentiate or to determine whether the nodule is malignant or benign. Uh, so for example, for thyroseq NGS, uh, when we do when we perform thyroseq NGS, a rule in it based on the presence and combination of mutations in certain genes associated with cancer and predict the impact of mutations. Uh, when, for, and the, another assay is Thygenext or Thyramir, where again, they rule in based on the presence and combination of mutations in certain genes. Um, but if the sample is tested negative, then they reflex it to Thyramir to rule out to distinguish between benign and neoplastic nodule. However, these assays have a varying positive predictive value and negative predictive value. What is unique to thyroseq is that they, uh, the genome classifier, genomic classifier, the, they provide uh, the genomic classifier score as compared to other NGS-based assays. Um, 
what this genomic classifier score is that each detected variant which they uh, detect in their assay, they uh, define a score of zero to two based on the strength of its association with malignancy. How they define uh, these scores is also based on extensive literature and uh, different data sets, their in-house database, um, RNA-seq analysis of thyroid cancer, and the cyto uh, cytoscan analysis of 17 thyroid cancer samples. So the total GC score they calculate by assigning um, the, the score to each of the variant they detected for SNV, for gene fusions, for gene expression analysis, and copy number analysis. And they add up all to give this score. Now, the next um, uh, OM, which Jane has talked about earlier, the, is the virome for the detection of high-risk HPV in head and neck cancer. So for detection of HPV, um, as we talked about the different methods like real-time PCR and Sanger sequencing, we utilize these for the, uh, for the testing of HPV. So the, in the specimen FFP, FNA, and FNA washes. So here is an example of real-time based testing where we perform the uh, HPV testing and four samples are positive and three are negative. Out of four positive, one was tested positive for uh, HPV-16. For the, for, to find out another um, marker, we need to run the Sanger sequencing on these three positive samples to determine which, uh, which of the HPV variant they have, like HPV-6, 33, or 35, and what's their link with. Now, um, in order to monitor the HPV, um, for monitoring purpose, we utilize high sensitive methods such as digital PCR. Um, we extract the CFDNA and then we perform digital PCR using a target gene, ESR1 gene, um, for, to check the quality of the uh, material. After the quality is checked, then we detect um, the amplicons within E6 and E7 genes, which is encoded by HPV. Strain and and um, E6 will code for high risk uh, HPV 16 strain, whereas E7 will identify HPV strains of 18, 31, 33, and 35. These will help to distinguish tumor drive uh, fragmented HPV DNA from native HPV genomic DNA. So here you can see, and they they have utilized this digital PCR technology um, for for the uh, for to monitor in the post treatment samples. So you can see that 87% of undetectable CTHPV DNA after six months of CRT. So these red ones are reflecting which have been tested positive for the uh, level of HPV um, after post-treatment and the blue ones are the ones which are negative. So in that way, you can monitor the levels or uh, levels of HPV and define the risk of recurrence. With this, I would like to thank our team, which work, um, uh, which work, and uh, for us. And I would like to thank Jane and the organizers. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Um, these were both outstanding lectures, and um, I really appreciate your efforts here. I wonder if you could just uh, comment briefly um, in terms of the amount of time required for turnaround. Um, and currently, it's it's set at uh, right around two weeks to get information back from Thyroseq on specific um, information for our indeterminate biopsies. Do you envision that that's going to be shortened over time, and and what's going to go into uh, being able to accomplish that? Um, go ahead, Manakshi. So I think for thyrosic, since it's an NGS-based assay, over the time, I think, again, it depends on what your need is. If, if you're looking for comprehensive profiling, then it's, we will have to select the NGS-based assay. But if you are looking for a specific or restricted biomarkers, then we can do a single gene testing, um, and that can increase the rapid turnaround time. So what, what would you envision um, that, that, the, um, that could be um, a year from now, five years from now, do you expect that that's going to be shortened? Um, with the overcoming technologies and also improvement in the bioinformatics pipeline, I feel that that can be improved over the time. Okay. And I, I concur with that. Um, there are different technologies and ways of developing and making libraries 
that will decrease the turnaround time. For example, we've been exploring and what we're bringing in now is a rapid turnaround time for the for the uh, AML cases um, that we have because for therapeutic purpose, there are guideline statements now that results are needed within 10 days. So in our clinical laboratory here, we have to often change our methods to accommodate that requirement for therapeutic purposes. So I would imagine you will also see a change over a period of time, maybe five years, yes. Great. Can you talk a little bit about one of the problems that we encounter, which is the presence of tumor necrosis and um, having enough available uh, material to be able to do an analysis here? Are there any strategies in order to overcome that? So we have we have uh, performed some assays on necrotic material uh, that has and generally for necrotic material, RNA is a no-go, but DNA, we do have a potential. However, it's a matter of if we don't find something or we don't detect something, then we will always have the caveat of potentially this sample is compromised. So while we could technically perform it, we don't have, we don't, that's what we would cover ourselves with. Um, there is always a possibility in all of these tissues that we actually uh, can macro dissect so that we are not analyzing necrotic material. Another option, depending on the disease, and it would require testing, of course, is to go to a liquid biopsy option. If the methodology is sensitive enough and there's proof that there's circulating tumor DNA in the lesion, you know, in those patients themselves that have the lesion under study. And that has been well documented now for patients with solid tumors uh, that are, re um, I don't want to necessarily say just metastatic, but that is becoming a more common uh, uh, solution if, if the actual tissues themselves are not available. Great. Um, one of our um, attendees has raised the question of whether allelic frequency is um, a helpful uh, measure to differentiate whether a mutation is global or only present in the tumor. Um, I, for example, if allelic frequency is under 50 percent, would that suggest that the mutation is present only in the tumor? Uh, yes, it can be helpful depending on the tumor burden of the sample that you are studying. For example, if you have a tumor burden of 80%, then you can even have variants present at about 50% VAF, um, and you would still have that dilemma as to whether this represents a, a genome, you know, a germline variant or a somatic. If the tumor burden happened to be a little bit lower, say for example, 20%, 25%, then if you had a variant at 50% or higher, then you may be more likely to consider a germline variant. Um, that being said though, if you have some genes amplified, for example, EGFR or BRAF or whatever, then that amplification event can actually cause an increase in the variant allelic frequency. We can also infer from the variant allelic frequency if we look at, and I'm adding this on as a little piece of additional information, you know, we don't always, not all assays, NGS assays report losses and gains, but we can often infer also the status of, for example, some genes that are known tumor suppressor genes like TP53, we can often infer whether or not, if we find a mutation, whether that is also associated with a loss or no loss and it's in a heterozygous state. So that VAF is actually very important for us to use and we interpret it in the context of multiple different features. Great. Um, one of our attendees has asked the question as to why tests um, uh, why molecular analysis tests fail? Is that a, something you could um, you could respond to? Why they fail? Correct. Manakshi, do you want to handle this one? 
it depends sometimes on the sample type we are receiving or if, if we receive a very short biopsy, we don't have enough material or if the sample is very old and fixed, then also you encounter these type of issues like it don't perform very well on the sequencing. Um, to overcome these problems, I think liquid biopsy is a good substitute. Great. In the final seconds remaining, there's tremendous enthusiasm and interest in identifying um, uh, relevant uh, biomarkers in uh, circulating DNA. Could you um, speak for a moment where you where you see that going, what the lim what our current limitations are, and um, what perhaps we can expect down the road here? I, I think that there are commercial enterprises out there who have who have done a very good job of giving and providing comprehensive mutation analysis um, on liquid biopsies in plasma for circulating tumor DNA. They they do have very good uh, uh, panels that they use. Um, they're not fully comprehensive. Um, those have been very useful. However, if you if you are trying to find, uh, it may depend more on your tumor burden and how much is being shed, which are features we cannot really define yet. I would like to think that with increasing technology, we can get more sensitive of, at those methodologies in terms of comprehensive nature. What I do see a major shift towards, and I think is going to be very useful, is more a focal gene uh, uh, with very high sensitivity so we can monitor patients better in a molecular setting rather than relying entirely on other technologies such as you know radiology to follow to follow patients once they've been treated. I think that's an area in which you will see greater utility of our molecular testing over time, especially in the liquid biopsy space. Do you have an example of what um, of specific um, genes that are currently being used as liquid for detection in liquid biopsies? Yes, so if you go, I, I, if you, there are companies, there is one particular company now who is, is actually testing for HPV in the circulating tumor, in the, sorry, in the, in the plasma, as Manakshi mentioned. In right. terms of mutations that may be in the tumors themselves, in the, in the genome, there are companies out there, I could mention their names if I'm allowed to, um, uh, Foundation Medicine, as well as Gardent, and there are others out there, uh, they they tend to follow some variants and they include, for example, in non-small cell lung cancer, they will often follow and look for the appearance of alterations associated with resistance for a drug, not necessarily to the level of minimal or measurable residual disease detection but they will use it in that regard. I think, as I mentioned, over time, I think we'll be doing more with a much greater sensitivity for more disease monitoring. Great. We have passed the, um, uh, the nine o'clock hour. I wanna thank you both and, um, for outstanding presentations and wanna thank all of our attendees for uh, joining us uh, today. Everybody stay safe, have a great weekend, um, and look forward to joining us next week. Thanks very much. Thanks, um, uh, Jane and Manakshi. Great, great uh, um, lectures here. Thank you. Thank you.